how do we determine, hint, 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 by the way, if vector functions are linearly independent? It's, it's a Ronskian, that's the correct answer, but because these are vectors themselves, and this is a first order system, it's a Ronskian that doesn't involve derivatives. Okay? So the answer is the Ronskian. And it, Ronskian looks exactly the same thing as it, as it did, did before. Recall, uh, in fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump out of this for just a second and go back to when we first saw the Ronskian, which I believe would have been maybe 4.3? Let's guess. Nope, I'm going to try 4.1. There it is. There's the run again that we saw before. So notice how we have scalar functions, but we have n of them. We put them across the first row, and then we put their derivatives on the next row all the way down to the n minus first derivative. But you take the determinant of that, and then if they are non-zero on the entire interval, then we say they are linearly independent. Okay? So now what we've got is we've got vector functions. So each function that we have is a column vector. So the Ronskian now in this context is just put each column in a matrix and take the determinant of that. So back to um, here. Think of, for example, these, uh, this example that I gave up here where I had the function x1 and x2 that were solutions to this linear system. This is a vector, right? looks like this right here. And this would be another vector function. We put this in the first column and this in the second column and take the determinant of that. And then the same um, theorem statement will determine that it is, in fact, linearly independent. So the Ronskian of a series of vector functions, in particular, n of them, you need n of them if the length of your vector is n, is simply the determinant of x1, x2, dot, 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 x, Okay, now that, again, determinant here, but keep in mind that each one of these x's are columns. So it really looks like this. It's like x1, 1 of t, x1, 2. I know this is kind of sideways from the way I would normally do a subscript notation, but this is the x1 column. column. Okay, so that right there is capital X1, and then you'd have an x21 of t, x22 of t, dot dot dot, x2n of t, all the way over to xn1 of t, xn2 of t, all the way down to xnn of t, take the determinant of that. And then I'm going to state this theorem loosely. The vectors x1 through xn on some interval i, if the Ronskian of those vectors is not equal to zero for every t out of i, then x1 through xn are linearly independent on i. So it... 
to me, I mean, if if I if I if I'm asked to do this in one of my homework, it feels nearly identical to what we were doing with the run scan before. But you know, when you get done with it, you realize, wait a minute, I didn't use any derivatives to do it. Well, you don't need derivatives because if you think about it, when we did the run scan before, we were looking at an nth order differential equation. So we had n of these functions, but if it was n order, and you go back to that Ronsky, and the highest derivative that was in the Ronsky was one less than the order of the equation. Right? Because you had first derivative, or zero derivative, all the way down to n minus first derivative. Question? What all those symbols mean? I know some. For all here, so every t in the interval i. Upside down a. Yes. Just means for every. For every. Yeah, as an element of, you should have seen that before because that's just basic set notation from algebra. But, yeah. Is an element of this interval i. Okay? So if the interval is, you know, from a to b, then t is somewhere between a and b. As long as it's true for everything on that interval, it's, it's uh, linearly independent. Now, again, going back to that Ron skin that we looked at before in 4.1, right here, notice the equation that we would be working with is an nth order equation, so it's got an nth derivative in it, but the Ron skin only goes up to the n minus first derivative. Well, now we're working with what order systems? What's the highest derivative that we have in our systems? Name of the section. Look, look at the equations right here. It's a first order linear system. What we learned back in kind of a transition section was that every higher order equation can be written as a first order system. So we don't really talk about higher order systems because we can convert them with a substitution into a first order system. So the Ronskian would only have up to one less derivative than the actual system has. But the system only has first derivatives. So that's why there's no derivatives in the Ronskian in this context. But you still get a square matrix out of it because all of your functions are columns. Okay? Um, let me see. Do I have an example in my notes here where we actually check that? Yeah, let's verify... I'm going to switch colors back to my better favorite color. Example, verify that x1, which is 1, negative 1, of e to the 2t, and x2, which is 3, 5, e to the 6t, are linearly independent. Okay. So, what does the Ron skin then look like? Leave the 2t, maybe the 2t, or 3t, the 6t, 5t, 6t. We're just multiplying this in component-wise. And now we take that determinant, forward minus back diagonal. There should not be a minus right there. It should be just e to the 2t. There's a minus e to the 2t. I had a minus up here, and that was wrong. Okay. So now I've got 5e e to the 8t minus a minus 3e e to the 8t, or 8e e to the 8t. So, what can you tell me about this? Because never zero, right? For all t, in fact, for all t in the reals, okay? Which means that x1 and x2 
are independent on negative infinity to positive infinity. Because this thing could never be zero, right? Eight's never zero, e to the eight t is never zero, so the product is never zero. Okay, so let me just write down a couple of important facts that carry over from what we did with uh, our higher order equations, even in, in, in 4.1. You had a question? Uh, you said x1, x2, or? R. R. A, R, E, sorry. Oh, okay. R, R independent on the entire real line. Okay, so a uh, quick comment here. Let me put it in a definition. Any set x1 through xn of linearly independent solutions to the homogeneous first order linear system of ODEs is called a fundamental set. Actually, that's a term we've used before, but that's saying that if I get n of them and the system is an nth, an n by n system, I meant to actually put that word with number in here, right here, stick the number n of n ODEs, right? So n here corresponds with the size of the system. So the general solution, again, will look like, I've already written it in your notes, but I'll write it one more time. This is to the homogeneous case. Is capital X equals a C1 times X1 plus C2 times X2 plus all the way out to CNX in and for non homogeneous systems x will be equal to some vector solution x of h plus another one called x sub p. And hopefully this looks kind of familiar to you. This is the homogeneous solution. This is a particular solution. And as it turns out, you can modify our methods that we used in chapter four. The two methods for finding the particular case, do you remember what those methods were? Variation of parameters and guessing. Method of undetermined coefficient. That's Sounds more sophisticated when you say that. The method of undetermined coefficients and the variation of parameters formulas were ways of solving for a particular solution, right? Method of undetermined coefficients is a guessing method. Variation of parameters involves um, a Ronskian approach based, based on Kramer's rule, essentially. 
you can do the same thing with systems, and, and we'll eventually do that. Uh, but for now, that's all I wanted to cover out of 8.1. So this is all the kind of preliminary theory. So now what we need to do is talk about how do we find the x1, x2, xn, right? Uh, think through again back to what one of these problems is going to look like. I'm going to give you a system that looks maybe like this and say find x1 and x2. And the clue that I gave you before is we're going to guess that the solution has a form of x e to the lambda t. Right? Some vector times e to the lambda t. And because of the way that you take the derivative of e to the lambda t, turns out that if you choose lambda being an eigenvalue and x being a corresponding eigenvector, then that resulting vector function x, that is a vector, an eigenvector times e to the eigenvalue t, will be a solution to this homogeneous system. And then we'll make things even more complicated by adding a non-homogeneous component and trying to find the solution there. Okay? Okay, so now what we need to know is how do you find eigenvalues and eigenvectors? That's what I'm going to do today. And then we're going to start solving these things. 